Hey everybody, it is April 17th, 2017. This is Human Factors Cast, episode 38. We're back to uh, another slow week of Human Factors news, but that's okay because we'll be breaking down everything from automated F-16s to vibrating bras. Uh, <laughs> and some other interesting personal stories. So strap on your smart bandages, your connected smart bandages, because Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, and it is a wonderful Monday to be back here is on it, HF Cast. Is it, though? Is it a really wonderful, wonderful Monday? Because I got, I got some... Well, that's very true. Nick, how's your Monday been? Not so great. Uh, it, it has, I'll be honest, has not been so great. So, yeah, we got we got some news this week, but it's a little bit slower, so I figured... What the hell? Let's talk a little bit about customer service meets user experience. So yeah, man. So I'm excited to hear about this because you got notes on it in it. You got it in the show notes. It's obviously about PlayStation's customer service. What has happened? So okay, so to, okay, okay. Oh, oh. As our listeners are familiar, I am a Star Wars fan, right? Okay. So they announced this Battlefront Two game over the weekend, and in my excitement, I mistakenly pre-ordered the thing on PlayStation digitally, right? Forgetting that I get a 20% discount on Amazon Prime for pre-ordering there, right? So anyway, I realize my mistake. I go to cancel my pre-order and I can't do it, right? Their terms of service block you from sort of getting this refund uh, from a game that's not even out yet, right? So I spent my money digital deluxe edition and everything it's what eighty dollars or something uh and i could have saved like 18 bucks on amazon so um anyway i uh i contacted them and i went through like three different levels of management and an hour and a half later uh they could still not you know ref- uh, they couldn't refund me they like it's against what yeah no it's against their terms of service they cannot refund me and like i wow. kept i kept telling the guy i was like hey you know, who do I go to next? He's like, I'm sorry, I'm the highest up the chain here, and I can't give you anybody else's number. I'm like, uh, that's BS. Like, give me somebody at corporate. Like, I want to let everybody know at corporate that this is BS because not only are you preventing me from, uh, I don't want to buy anything else on their system now because it's such a stupid policy, right? And well, that's a- kind of the thing too. Is if they if that's happened to enough people or if it was easy enough. I I mean what. Sorry, let's back up a second. Did you say you accidentally like de- I, just ordered it from them? Okay, so in my excitement, I purchased it okay, from them, yeah. right? So gotcha. I went to the website, and I was like, oh, pre-order. Okay, I bought it on PlayStation. I I bought it, right? And then I, I remembered, oh, yeah, I can buy it from somebody somewhere else or cheaper. But no, these guys want my money more than they want my loyalty to their brand, and that really irks me. And so... Because we're on a podcast, Blake, and we have this wide outlet where we can shit on anything we want, I just want to call out Sony customer service for being terrible. Oh, my God. What a crap user experience, man. Like, I am pretty upset about it. Yeah, and that seems like, I don't know. I I wasn't involved, but that seems like an odd thing to have in your, like, user service agreement that if they pre-order something, they can't go back on it. Right. I mean, okay. Okay. I, I just don't really see the the point in that for them. So let me break this down too, because in some countries it's okay to cancel your pre order, and then in some other countries it's not okay to cancel. Like, I just don't understand why you would prioritize money over loyalty, because loyalty is going to get you more money in the long run. Am I right? Like, I don't know. I just, yeah. I mean, that's the way we would think about it, right? Is that you're, I don't know, the more you do for your customer, the more likely they're going to just endorse and use your brand. Um, but it's just kind of like sounds like it's falling short in whatever for whatever reason they have those things where you can't reverse any kind of digital pre order stuff. That's kind of yeah. nuts. It, it it was it was really uh, an awful experience. And if anyone from PlayStation is listening and can issue me a refund, that would be excellent um, because I'm not going to order from you guys again. 
I'm, I'm call- and to any of our listeners, if you're even thinking about something, don't order from Sony PlayStation. Order it from somewhere else. Give somebody else your money. I'm using this platform <laughs> to, to, to influence Sony's sales because this is awful. This is terrible. All right, but enough of that. I don't want to like bitch and moan the entire podcast. So let's move on. But to I d- so you do have something else in here about the <clears throat> Nintendo Switch, Nick. And if I remember I do. correctly going backwards, like we've even talked about some of the bad stories that came up in the news from the design of the Switch. And if yeah. I've seen that you like finally got to try it out, I, I want to hear how it was. Uh, you know what, man? I was going to go somewhere else with this before I went to the Switch because it would just seem like I was just continuously angry about stuff. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> There's a reason I put that bullet point in the middle of those. It's okay, though. So the Nintendo Switch, uh, it seems like all my suspicions were confirmed. I I had a hard time. Oh, this sucks. I really was hoping it like wowed you or you got excited somehow about it. No. No. It was... T- it just... Oh. there was Okay, so... it. Look, here's the thing. It wasn't as bad as I was expecting, but it wasn't as great as I was hoping. Does that make sense? Gotcha. No, it does, for sure. So I have to ask you this. What game did you play? So I played a couple. So I got got a chance to play 1-2 Switch, which is a a $60 waste of time. And it's uh, (laughs) it's like Wii Sports. I'm sorry. It's it's like Wii Sports, but... um, you you play all these party games, I guess, and it was okay, but I I wouldn't. I thankfully, thankfully, I I you know went over to a friend's house and tried it there uh, before actually purchasing this myself. But um, yeah, no, it was it was uh, it was just gimmicky and uh, very reminiscent of Wii Sports, but not as good. Um, oh, that's a bummer. I also what got, else did you try? I also got a chance to try out Zelda Breath of the Wild, which. I can see why everyone is turned on to this game. Now that is the one gem among this this system is is uh, Breath of the Wild. Like there are literally no limits in that game, and it was apparent just after ten minutes of playing that you know I, I played more than ten minutes, but after ten minutes I could tell oh this is something special. So I I will be getting one just for that, and uh, you know if they bring in other properties which. You know, Nintendo's near and dear. Uh, it could be good. It could be good. But still, the the whole switching, the, the Switch aspect of the Nintendo Switch, where you're, you know, t- picking up the Joy-Cons and putting them into another controller, it just, it it's all too messy. And, like, the, the kickstand thing was really disappointing. I don't know. And, and I talked to the, the person who owned it, and they were a little disappointed as well. So, overall... Uh, I don't want this whole first what well we're like eight minutes in to be, you know, crapping on other people's parades. But uh, let's move on to something positive, man. Are you um, are you gonna be out at the March for Science this weekend? So I wanted to ask you what this was because I don't even know what it is. Whoa, March for Science. Uh, this is a uh, so that we had the women's march a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, and uh, it's basically uh, a march to say. Science is a real thing, and it's not a, just a liberal conspiracy. It is you, it, there is science based in facts and uh, research, and uh, it's just a way for the scientific community to get out there and express, you know, our our uh, sort of pride for science, if you will. So, Nick, this is kind of freaking me out that I'm going to open a can of worms. But who is out there questioning the validity of science? Oh. Have um, let's not open that can of worms on the show. But uh, all right, so, incorrect platform. But yeah, that that, that that's sounds okay. like an awesome cause. I'm kind of bummed that it sounds like it needs to be done for the case making a case for science. But know. you know, whatever you got to do to support the cause. I mean, that's I'll have to look that up because this is yeah. definitely something I'm that's near and dear to my heart. So for sure, for sure. And so cool. I'm not sure which which one I'm going to yet. It could be either. Uh, Los Angeles or San Diego, but if any of our listeners are listening and uh, happen to see me out there, and potentially you too, Blake, if you're going, let them know uh, through the tweets, the twits, the twitters. Um, it is, yeah, yeah. Let them know, and uh, if you guys see us out there, say hi. We are we are not shy, and we will uh, talk to you 
ad nauseum about human factors and uh, Star Wars and um, poor Sony customer service. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, yeah. Oh, man. All right, well, uh, I think that's it for the uh, let's waste time talking about platform stuff. Now let's talk about the uh, the little bit of news that we got this week. This is the part of the show all about human factors news. This could be anything from artificial intelligence, virtual reality, automation, medical transportation, psychology, whatever it is, as long as it has to do with the field of, you guessed it, human factors, it's fair game. Blake, what do we have up first? So up first, we got a lot of car and GM stories this week, and we'll just kick it off with them. So General General Motors is looking to leapfrog its competitors in the autonomous driving space by developing a larger fleet of cars than any of them, perhaps as many as 300, according to documents obtained by the IEEE Spectrum. Bosch and GM have filed for the FCC's applications to deploy vehicular radar units in Detroit, San Francisco, and Scottsdale. However, the FCC has not yet granted the special licensing for these vehicles, so it could be a while before they are deployed. Now, Nick, I didn't realize that so many different companies, including Bosch and and GM, were really trying to get a fleet of cars out there with these radar units to go ahead and put them on the streets. Yeah, so this really... um... This really makes me wonder if they're going to be testing swarm technology, right? To see if uh, you know the the sensors on one car can communicate with another car to inform both the autonomous systems on board and the driver in you know that that may or may not be in the loop. Uh, what's going on, uh, either further down the road or behind them? Like that, that's yeah, I mean, interesting to me. It's going to I'm assuming they're going to have to do that, right? And the the thing that struck me is I guess Bosch and GM are definitely well connected, but how is this all going to interact with separate companies um outside of the GM? Right. So yeah, that's who knows. I mean, that's the frontier, man. Like that's that is where uh we're trying to get to, right? How how can we make it so that way um obviously the swarm technique would uh be better for everybody if everybody communicated there's like a there's like a a wireless network that everyone is connected to and that data is spread across all cars but of course because data is proprietary there will undoubtedly be restrictions on that and so they are basically trying from what i've seen they're basically trying to build it into one car one system and if it can communicate with others fine but one car needs to be able to do it all yeah, and you would, I would assume that, I mean, even if they're going to be competing against, against each other, you would want this to be as safe as possible. I mean, you're, you're having to compete against each other, but also getting the FCC to approve what you're doing. So I'm, I'm assuming that before the FCC starts licensing and letting vehicles be run autonomously, they're going to have to determine whether technology communicates with communicates across like different vendors of it be it gm or bosch or cadillac or any of those guys so i'm, I'm sure that's a consideration but it, i don't know if that'll be the easiest thing to go through because that requires a little bit of interaction between gm engineers and let's say people that work for like tesla or different yeah. companies like that yeah you're absolutely right uh it's it's really comforting though to like look at the human factors news every week and see oh wow you know, uh, another company, another more driving cars, more self-driving cars, more autonomy, more, um, y- more of all this technology. But the one piece that I am continuously sort of astounded by is that they're not looking into how the human fits into all this, right? If if you have a completely autonomous system, right, with a, with a human that's not in the loop, then you you don't have to worry about the human, right? The car just does everything. But if you have a system where the human has to take over in the case of emergency, then they do have to be aware of what's going on. Uh, and and uh, Cadillac's doing something with that. You want to go on to the next story here? Yes, they certainly are. So Cadillac is rolling out its uh, Super Cruise technology in its flagship CT6 sedan later in the summer. The feature lets the car drive itself on the highway and maintaining position within the lane and maintaining safe di- safe following distance from other cars. It seems like Cadillac's a little late to this party because some other companies like Tesla, or Mercedes, and BMW have already rolled out models that can at least do this much. However, Cadillac's 
difference is that they've deployed a way to ensure the driver is fully engaged in the event of an emergency by installing cameras in their steering wheels. The cameras monitor the actual driver's gaze to ensure that driver keeps their eyes on the road or keeps checking the road in autonomous driving mode in order to keep them in the loop throughout the driving. So this is re- this is really important and kind of interesting as far as the fact that like we, we want really like fully autonomous cars, but how do you bridge the gap between, okay, something's wrong with the automation. How do we get the user in the loop? And they're not making sure they're not like sleeping in the back seat when something goes wrong. And I think this is a, a great way to do it with the gaze monitoring. This is one way to do it for sure. Tesla also has the, uh, a way to keep the drivers in the loop where, uh, you have to basically keep your hands on the steering wheel. And if it detects that, um, your hands are not on it, then it'll start slowing down. Uh, so, so a combination of these methods would definitely make you know it, it, it easier for the operator first off but then you know they, you have to think about other things like just because they're staring forward and their hands are on the wheel doesn't mean their mind is present it will help with that for sure but i could very easily be just kind of resting on the steering wheel gazing forward daydreaming uh and and stuff is going on around me but i'm not perceiving it right so there's still that whole problem so it's it's a step in the right direction but we're not quite there yet but I think something something to kind of keep in mind, too, is that at least from the Cadillac version, because that was what the article was about, it does – like if it notices that you're not doing the glances in the correct way, it will start throwing a bunch of auditory alerts at you. And then even if you if you can't seem to grab control of the car at that point, then it's going to stop the vehicle and then call OnStar services for you. So, I mean, it's <laughs> – I think it's still really in a good direction just because, I mean, it's monitoring your gaze. So it's a little more engaging than just like tapping the steering wheel every once and again. And if they're going to throw a bunch of alerts at you, if you start doing something wrong, I mean, it's giving you a better chance to get back in the loop and figure out what you need to do. No, I I agree. I think it's great. And, and uh, thank you for pointing out to me that they're actually analyzing where the driver's looking and, and taking into account those, those gazes to make sure they're uh, periodically checking the rear view mirrors, the side mirrors. That's all great. Like this is, this is exactly what we need to keep the driver in the loop is if we, we need an autonomous system that both keeps an eye on the road, but then also an eye on the driver to make sure the driver is aware of what's going on on the road too. That's all really cool, man. Like I'm, I'm really excited to see where autonomous vehicles go. Well, speaking of autonomy, we have autonomous vehicles actually in the sky in the next story. No, that's crazy. (laughs) Yeah. So there's a lot of focus, of course, around autonomous cars these days, and it's easy to forget that the military is actually trying to plug artificial intelligence into fighting vehicles, too. In a recent test, military contractors used an unmanned system autonomously flying an F-16 combat jet as a wingman to support a human pilot in a separate aircraft the system successfully met its goals to adapt plan and execute maneuvers all on its own now nick we talked we've talked a lot about autonomous cars in the past few weeks and that's all cool and dandy but this is something that really blows my mind like a full-blown f-16 being able to support itself with ai yeah and the the part that blows me away is not only that it's it's able to support itself, but it's able to support its human counterpart that it's in the sky with. It can analyze the other human's flight pattern and match itself to those flight patterns. And I, I believe they even tested a, round, a couple rounds on this, right? Like they, they did air-to-ground strikes with this? Yeah, they did. They did combat maneuvers and also like uh, different like assessing different threats. So basically having to make sure that I'm not sure what kind of paradigm they use for their AI, but I mean, it was basically saying that we're throwing different threats at it. So it has to adjust in real time. So that's just crazy to me because we, we've moved away from having pilots in the actual aircraft to being drone operators behind a desk who are then controlling a joystick that controls a drone, right? So we've taken the operator out of danger. Now we are introducing an artificial intelligence agent that will make decisions that are maybe potentially better than what the human operator can make. And uh, it's very exciting and scary to me that this is happening. Like... (laughs) 
Yeah, I mean, it's somewhere in the middle because the great thing about it is, is it lets, the, I guess, the main pilot do other duties and they want it to focus on as much, kind of like if you have to do mid, mid-mission mid combat planning or just takes your, it takes a little bit of the cognitive strain off. But it is a little crazy that it's a full F-16 that's flying autonomously in support. Um, it's it's pretty awesome. But the, the one thing I do wonder is if with so much technology going into these jets, like how long is somebody actually going to need to pilot the actual combat jet? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I wonder when that's going to move the, like the next step is putting basically these guys pilots in, in like the, the unmanned joystick seats, yeah. but who knows, but there must be a reason why that, that switch is going very slowly. I just don't know what it is. Uh, Yeah. I don't know. Could be political. Could be uh, other reasons. But uh, yeah, let's let's move on to the next one, man. This just that, that just blows my mind. I can't I can't even fathom self flying jets that can issue their own strikes based on feedback. Like it's a, it's I won't lie. Like I, I work in the defense industry, but that is scary to me, man. <laughs> 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 oh man! Well, this next one might ease you up a little bit. So, uh, so Stephen Wang and his team of researchers at the University of Nottingham in the UK have developed a machine lear- learning algorithm that can predict your likelihood of having a heart attack or stroke as well as any doctor can. So using four different computer learning al- algorithms, Wegg and his team were able to raise the percentage of correct heart attack or stroke predictions from 72.8% to around 76.4%. So from a pool of around 80 3,000 patient test records using these algorithms, they were able to identify an extra 355 lives that could have been saved saved had these algorithms existed. So we go from uh, potentially killing people with artificial intelligence to potentially saving people with artificial intelligence. (laughs) It's the beauty of the all-encompassing thing that is AI, I guess. This is is pretty incredible. Now we just need to develop AI that can determine which lives are more... uh, more valuable than others. Actually, I want to do like a quick sidebar here. H- have you heard about this? Um, they're using artificial intelligence in courts to uh, determine who is guilty and who is innocent. And I, th- I think now, how a- are they doing that? Is that like, you know, excuse me, analyzing just voice patterns? I don't know, man. I, I saw the article on Wired the other day and I, I didn't actually read through it, but um. Yeah, they it, it was a it was an editorial, so they were saying that it was wrong and that you shouldn't do it. And uh, I I need to go digging a little bit because that that's really interesting to me that you know that is potentially condemning somebody based off of a computer's decision. And so let's get back to this story though. Um, th- that's definitely something we should t- touch on in the future. But um, do you know what data they're they're uh, gathering here? So th- I think what they were doing is they're using past records because uh, they ah. talked about how they had used, uh, I don't know, somewhere in the 400,000 range of um, old data that was fed from patients. And they used about 300,000 of these just to generate the internal predictive models for Got the AI. It. And then the last kind of 100,000 used them to actually test it. So there, there are existing guidelines that help oh, doctors oh, oh. kind of diagnose. I, I see it here. The they say eight factors, including age, cholesterol level, blood pressure. Um, mm, oh, uh, it doesn't give the full list here, but those are the, th- the three they give. So, yeah. So historical yeah, so data. Yeah, like the, the guidelines that exist already that help doctors to, right. you know, make these calls. But what was interesting to me about the article is it, going through using their algorithm, they found correlations that aren't necessarily listed in these d- these eight guidelines. So it's they're thinking this is kind of how the algorithm is able to up the ability to better predict um, heart attack or stroke. Yeah, no, that's that's great. I think this is fantastic. Um and this kind of plays into what you were talking about. I think last week or the week before we were talking about the woman who um, who sort of was paying attention to her fitness tracker and noticed that her heart rate was higher than it had been. And she went into the hospital and she had blood clot um, or, or something like that. Right. Am I remembering this correctly? Yeah, yeah, you got it right. So I'm wondering then. Yeah, you I seem to recall you mentioning that something like that they could run an algorithm and potentially warn you if, if you are going to have a heart attack or something like that. And so um, 
Yeah, I can see that totally being applied to this as well. So I, I think it's great that researchers are out there trying to get, uh, trying to solve these problems using algorithms and um, basically taking that user error off of the doctors, right? Like that, that if, if an, if an artificial intelligence system can more accurately and more reliably uh, diagnose these heart attacks or, or likelihood of heart attacks, then that takes one more duty off of the doctor to be able to do other things. Like how do you fix the heart attack or how do you like pr help prepare somebody for that? They don't, they no longer have to, uh, fill up their mind with how this happens and they, they don't have to spend their resources there. They can spend it in in uh, helping rather than diagnosing. Does that make sense? No, it does. And actually, like, this is a big trend across a lot of companies now. Like, there's, there's one in Canada that they've, uh, they're using a similar kind of idea. So taking a machine learning algorithm and applying it to breast cancer screenings. Because, I mean, I think, or at least this, I got this a lot in class and signal detection theory, you always hear about doctors trying to diagnose cancer from uh, radiology screens or x-rays. And there's like a high percentage of false positives or and even errors in that field. And so using machine alert or machine algorithms can help doctors to not have to one worry if they've made a false positive or if they've misidentified cancer um, and let them focus more on the treatment in oncology versus having to wonder like, okay, did I make the right call? So I don't know. I think this is only going to increasingly change the medical field, especially as we're continuing to get more data from people and it's moving away from being a snapshot. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, this thing, this, this article says it's, it's 3%, right? Give or take, it's like 3.5% or something. And, uh, yeah, I think you're right. That sounds really low, but that's, they said 355 extra lives. That's significant. That is really significant. Yeah. Well, for sure. It, if Although, you think about it in percentages, I mean, 3.5%, it's, it's, it sounds kind of low, but like you said, that many lives, uh, how do you really make that call? Another another quick sidebar, Blake. How do you feel about the word significant um, in terms of scientific I have significance? Mixed, I have mixed feelings about it because it, it, I would rather look at the numbers and make my own determination, if that makes any sense. Yes. Um, <laughs> I get very weird about statistical significance like unless you know all the hard facts the sample size would they actually run what were they looking for yada yada i mean I, you probably you probably feel something similar right i we, do we've had thesis experiments where it's kind of like eh, this feels weird i do and that's that's our job as scientists is to analyze the research and make sure it's a meaningful contribution right when i was when i was being taught i was always taught don't look at significance look at meaningfulness right and uh to me three percent it might it might be 0.5 or 0 0.05 and under, right? Who cares? But 355 lives, that is significant. That is sig that sorry, that is meaningful. That is yeah. meaningful. Uh, I just I just had to bring that up because uh that's a, that's a really great point, man. I actually didn't even think about it like that, but that's an awesome way to look at it. Yeah, my my mentor was great with uh always teaching me to be looking for that meaningful difference. If it's if it's not significant, you don't have a story. To, if it's not meaningful, you don't have a story to tell. It could be significant but not meaningful. You want something that's both significant and meaningful. So I, I, I don't know. That's that's something that I would I would like to spread to our listeners. If you're listening and doing research, remember you're looking for meaningful things, not significant things. And that's not to discount any research that you've ever done. That's just to say, you know, make make sure. And I'm sure our listeners are good about this, but make sure your your research is meaningful. Make sure you find meaning in what you're doing, because that's that's yeah, because that's the hallmark of good science. Yeah, you want to be adding to the world that you live in, not just you know getting significant numbers. Right. Hey, uh, really quick, another sidebar. Wow, I just want to make a big uh, big thanks to our friends over at Science Daily, TechCrunch, and Gadget and Wired for all the stories this week. We do post those on our Facebook and our Twitter. Uh, so you can go check those out throughout the week for all the original source articles. Just, again, want to thank them for helping us out. Uh, Blake, what do we have up next? So this is something that you and me and the rest of the scientists and probably a lot of other people will be super familiar with, and that's scatter plots. Woo. So scatter plots are widely, <laughs> widely used to visually communicate relationships between two or more data variables. So, however, the default design of scatter plots often 
represent data poorly, and very few people realize that the effect of visual design of scatter plots can have the effect that they can have on human perception and understanding. So researchers have recently found an algorithmic re- approach to automatically improve the design of scatter plots by exploiting models and measures of human perception. The optimizer developed by these researchers can predict how users would respond to a given design, taking into account a number of capabilities and limitations of human perception. Now, Nick, I think this is a great tool, especially because scatter plots can be misleading or hard to understand if it's not something you're familiar with. And this really spoke to me because I always like seeing research or things that are being developed for not just scientists, but that'll benefit people as a whole to hopefully better understand science. Right. So I, I like scatter plots because they, uh, yeah, they're hard to read sometimes, but they are probably the most pure form of data visualization, right? Because you are getting all of that raw data on one graph. You have the X and you have the Y. And, uh, so so in that sense, you have all the data points on one graph. There is no way that you can alter that data or manipulate that data to make it look better or worse, right? I mean, I mean there are still ways that you can do it with graphing and, and all that, but it's harder when you have all the data in one place. Uh, it's not like just displaying the averages or the ranges. You know, you are literally displaying every point of data. And so the fact that they came up with this um, this algorithm that that sort of modifies the way uh, it's it's uh, displayed, I'm I have mixed feelings on it, right? So what they're doing is they're modifying the way these scatter plots look in order for the human that is looking at the graph to perceive it in a way that's more accurate to uh, the data it represents, right? Yeah, that's the general idea. And so. So technically, everything is still there, but the the way they're altering it looks like uh, they're they're just toggling opacity on it. At least in this uh, this article here. Yeah, I mean that's that's what this one looks like. It's doing is just kind of changing some of the visual aspects to make it a little more, I don't know, aesthetically pleasing and do it in such a way that it makes people like like looking at it which is a little hard cuz you might be losing some of some of the data within that right. or i don't know I losing mean, a bit of the story the data tells maybe is a better way to put it to me this looks like a heat map and uh again you guys can follow along with this article it's the science daily one uh th- th- it looks like a heat map to me and this is this is a good visualization i kind of like it uh and Look, I'm not I'm not against any way that you can um, increase comprehension of data, right? If it if it leads to a better understanding of what's actually going on, uh, then that's great. And I I think this does. I think this does it, man. Like, there's a bigger concentration in the areas that are darker on the right graph. Like that's that's what I'm getting out of this. Yeah, and I think that's the point because I mean, if you look at the one and like Nick said, this is the silence was it silence daily article i mean the one on the right would be maybe a little bit misconstrued if you just looked at it and didn't really know what you're looking at because that's so much so many data points i mean it's it looks the one on the left complete yeah sorry one on the left yeah. but versus what they've done on the right how they manipulated it, it gives you a better sense of okay here's really the concentration of what's going on it's much more central than it looks on the left hand side so i th- but honestly i and I don't know who this is really geared towards because, of course, this is a lot done by researchers themselves. But I still feel like you would have to know what you were looking at right, uh, to really make a good interpretation of their results. No, I agree. Yeah, I, I don't know if this is – I think this is a cool idea. And I might use this in some of the data visualizations I'm producing for some of the projects I'm on. Um, just because I, – I mean, I think I like it. I think it's cool. Because, uh, yeah, the, the, the it's hard to – it's hard to display a scatter plot with a million data points on it because then the graph just becomes totally oversaturated with points. But if you toggle the opacity and make it look like a heat map, then I think I think that accurately represents the data. That's that's what ultimately so. when it, that's ultimately what you want to get back at is does it accurately represent the data and can you understand what you're looking at? And I think this does the trick. 
Yeah, they, I mean, they've definitely done it. They called it the Optimizer, and I definitely think, think that's what it does for sure. Is that the episode title? The Optimizer. Ugh, there you go. Why not? Free plug for them, right? <laughs> uh, oh, well, maybe not. Uh, we we got to think of a good title. Let's let's sit on that. Uh, maybe <laughs> maybe right. combine that with you one of our. Keep on moving. The, the optimizer robotic leg. I don't know. I'm I'm just I'm just spitballing here. What's up next? Why not? All right. So Toyota is introducing a new robotic leg brace called the Well Walk WW1000 that can help patients with partial paralysis affecting one side of their body walk again. The robotic exoframe is worn on the affected leg with a large motor component at the knee joint that provides just enough assistance to the patient, letting them recover on their own, on their, recover their own walking ability therapeutically over time. So well walk will be made available to medical institution in medical institutions in Japan later this year with the goal of drastic, drastically reducing recovery time for patients overcoming partial paralysis. So I, I don't know. I, I thought this one was pretty amazing because, again, we're seeing, like, the advancement of robotics applied to the medical field, which has got to be one of my favorite things when we do these stories. Yeah, lots um, of medical news. What do you think news. about it, Nick? Lots of medical news this week. I'm I'm really – I don't know, man. Even even being in the, in the field and, um, you know, seeing this stuff every day, I'm, I'm consistently blown away with the advances that we're making. Like if you if you were to look five years ago at what we were doing and and what we're doing now, like it just, I don't know. I'm I'm consistently surprised, and it's always presents a new challenge, right? Like, how is this person going to strap this thing on? How are they going to use it on a day to day basis? How do they make it comfortable? Like the ergonomics behind this thing, um, the fact that like what is just the right amount of help. Uh, for their current condition is is different across different people. These are all the problems that us human factors specialists have to come up with or answers to, right? So, I I I I'm looking at all these tools and I'm looking at all the things, all the neat, you know, exciting things that are coming out, and I'm always coming back to what problems do we have to solve then? So so. I mean, I think this this particularly, and I mean, a lot of the other stories cover this too, but it, it brings a nice intersection between, like, it, in this case, what would, what would typically be done by a th physical therapist is now being assisted by a robot and basically a treadmill, but then it requires them to either interact with a human factors practitioner themselves uh, in order to understand kind of like, okay, how is all of this going to affect my planning of their rehab? What are, what are things I need to watch out for? And that potentially hopefully is built into some of the output data that comes from these machines. So I, I right. think it's a cool intersection between different kinds of fields and us having to really be out there on the forefront of a lot of these products to help people correctly use them and really understand their needs. Yeah. I Yeah. Man, and I'm 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 reading ahead at this next story because I I want to talk about this. This is cool. You want to move on to the next one? Let's do it. Yeah, let's go. All right. So Welsh researchers at Swansea University are changing how medical bandages work by adding 5G wireless data to them. So these researchers are planning trials of smart 3D printed bandages that will use nano size sensors and 5G wireless data to constantly relay details about your health. This technology could help physicians customize treatment plans based on the gate, the data ga gathered. Nice. In pro such as the progress of the how your wound is healing, your location, and even your activity level. So, Nick, you sounded stoked about this. What do you think? Oh man, it's it's another one of those things where I'm just like the technology will drive work for us. Like, I love engineers for coming up with this stuff because it will consistently keep us employed. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, this one sounds particularly that way because I don't, I don't know it, it. There's a lot baked into a bandage in this, in this case. Yeah, I'm surprised. Like, I need to read more into this technology. Like, cause, cause I, I, I mean, I'm sure many of our listeners will know. Like, it's hard for us to really wrap our head around some of the engineering stuff um, because we deal primarily with uh, the human side of things. And so to be able to understand how this technology works, uh, I need to dig a little bit deeper, honestly. But, my God, this is awesome. This is so cool. 
uh, I want a 5G band. I want uh, like the tr- it, it's like a fitness tracker to the extreme that like monitors your condition in recovery. Yeah, and the fact that it could monitor progress of a wound healing was really that I just I was flabbergasting to me that just using nano sensors yeah. and collecting data from them could really tell you a lot more about the health of a wound or how your recovery is going. Yeah. Yeah. And one and one like particular application of this one that I I thought would be great because it talk we talked a little bit a second ago about kind of like physical therapy with uh, paralysis patients, but if you put this kind of technology in like knee braces or anything like that for joints, you could really see a lot of different benefits and customized treatment plans for people like that. But I still can't get over the analyzing your healing wound. I know that is crazy to me. Like it can probably tell the like micrometers of the gash in your skin or something like ah, it's so cool it's so cool to me it's so cool uh what's this next story okay go ahead and go ahead and move on to the next story here all right so at the chi 17 conference in denver this year a team of researchers from hasso platner institute in postam showed off a haptic the objects by electrical stimulation in vr so researchers hooked up subjects with a medical grade eight channel muscle simulator stimulator installed in a backpack and attached electrodes to their forearms and biceps The electrodes then automatically applied a mild electric shock when they touched or lifted a virtual object. That tenses the the activated muscle, repulsing the user's hand and making them feel feel they're pushing against a wall or picking up a heavy cube. Co-author Pedro Lopez uh, thinks they are thinks there's a need for physicality in VR and the next big step is bigger force and more physical sensations. Now, Nick, you are pretty much my VR expert. What do you think about the physicality in VR? It's definitely necessary. It's a whole nother level of immersion, right? And I always, uh, I always try to prepare people the first time they experience VR, right? Cause most, okay. So most, most people, uh, at least that I introduced VR to, are familiar with the video gaming scene, right? And you have several axes of control. You have front, back, left, right, uh, and then you control the camera. But uh, when you get into VR, you no longer have to control the camera because that is your head, right? So you, it, it's it's one more natural progression for virtual reality control. So if you think about this in the sense of if you are feeling what is happening in the virtual environment as well, that is one more sensory input that you are masking in a virtual environment, right? And uh, I think this is absolutely necessary. And you've seen this before with, uh, or or at least people, researchers have tried to get around this problem of, um, you know, physicality. So, So there's a... There's a researcher in Florida, uh, and I'm blanking on the name. I'm really sorry. Uh, we probably have listeners at UCF, but um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to get reamed for this one, I know. He did uh, a virtual reality system where it was in this big auditorium, and uh, basically y- you walk, and they alter your perception one frame to the left every couple seconds. So it's imperceptible to you, but you are walking in a giant oval in this room and it feels like you're walking forever because that one degree or that one frame to the left will subconsciously correct your uh, gait to sort of walk in a circle. And so there's definitely a need for it. uh, And this is one other way to mask how you are in VR interacting with the physical environment, right? So if you were to... um, you don't want people to run into walls in the physical environment. And if, likewise, if you're running up against the end of a tether on a VR cable or something, you want to provide them with that feedback without breaking that immersion. So to have like a physical wall that they then feel, so they're like, oh, I can't go any further. And there's, you know, slack in their um, tether. And by tether, I mean the, the cable that connects the VR headset to the computer. Um then they're able to go, okay, I get the feedback. I, I need to turn around and go somewhere else. And uh, also, you know, there, there's definitely a need for physicality in VR because you see companies like 
no, excuse me, Oculus and uh, PlayStation VR developing these uh, handheld controllers that you know map to your physical hands location. And so, yes, there is definitely a need for it. Like, I can't speak to it enough. This is cool. Yeah, this is an awesome, like, I don't know, expansion of what VR will be like. Because I, I think it's great that they're getting so much, like, muscle activity and then able to use that... Uh, give you the perception that you're like you're hitting a wall or you're picking something heavy up and throughout the article what i the part that i took away that's not necessarily the focus of this but they were saying that it was relatively not out of scope to put these kind of haptic systems like in a piece of clothing that you would wear right so it's less invasive than having like a backpack with an ems on the back installed oh yeah Uh, so it's i don't know i'm looking forward to as it gets more in more and more that VR is out there. And I'll have to check out the article you just mentioned because that's a really cool concept. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's phenomenal. I'm, I'm really sorry for blanking on the name because uh, I, I'm they're they're pretty well known in the VR field. But uh, I'm going to get reamed. For, I, I know the comments section is just going to be uh, blowing up on this one. All right. Uh, speaking of wearable stuff, <laughs> Blake, take us to our last story for this week. <laughs> All right, so to wrap things up, the Vitali is a new sports bra hitting Kickstarter that focuses on the other side of your well-being, keeping track of your breathing, posture, and heart rate to help you maintain that yoga-like calm at the on and off the mat. So the bra will track your heart rate, variability, and breathing to keep tabs on your wellness, while a built-in gyroscope and accelerometer help monitor the position of your spine and pecs to make sure that you're maintaining proper posture. If you're slouching or hunched over, the bra will give you a gentle buzz to remind you to sit up. Now, Nick, I was really excited about this (laughs) because I don't know if you know or if any of our listeners know, but I'm Definitely an advocate of physical fitness and love yoga and understand this calm on and off the mat. And I know this doesn't apply to me, but this gives me hope that there will be something similar for guys as far as being able to remind you to keep your spine upright and be measuring that while you're kind of just going throughout your day-to-day life. But I thought this was a great, um, great thing to come out, and I'm stoked to see what it does on Kickstarter. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Nick and Blake Mansplain the Bra. I think that's the episode title. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, this is uh, yeah. I I'm always down for more trackers, uh, and because the more data you have available, the better off you are. I feel once you know we can integrate these algorithms that we talked about earlier, and this is just one more thing that. If you have this data, you can you can track how you're doing over time. You can track uh, how well you're doing in the moment. I love I love having data about me and my body. And uh, while yes, this is not for men. Uh, hopefully, they I I think I they have to have like uh, shirts or something that that do the same thing. Uh, we should we should definitely research on that. Um, well, I mean, all this design really is that, that allows this to happen is what they what what she calls a small like gym device that it that, like slips into a part of the bra. So, I mean, you could you could easily do that with like a skin tight shirt for a guy to measure the same types of things. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts, Blake, on uh, man's I bras? I do and... not. All right. Well, that's going to be it for today, everyone. If you have any suggestions for any news stories that we may have missed. Uh, you can follow us on all our social media. Head on over to our Human Factors Cast Facebook page. Go ahead and comment on our SoundCloud. Let me have it for not remembering that researcher's name. Uh, reach us at H Factors Podcast on Twitter. We love to hear from you. Uh, or wow, that sounded creepy, right? Or, <laughs> or send us an email at Human Factors. Little weird. Human Factors Cast at Gmail dot com. If you're really saucy, spicy like we were last week, you can leave us a voicemail at. Uh, 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If you like what we're doing, because we bring these things to you ad-free, you can support us financially on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on iTunes, because those always help us out. Uh, they make us feel good. They make other people you know, find us and stuff. Jeez, this is a long outro. Thanks for sticking around. <laughs> I want to thank my panel for being on the show today. Blake Arnsdorf, where can they find you? 
You guys can find me at Don't Panic UX on Twitter. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your Monday. On the tweets. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. Oh, it, it depends. It depends.